hear stories about addiction? We might. Oh. Stories about recovery, too? Hmm. But mostly stories about how addiction turns smart, sensitive people into liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. Liars? And thieves? And gluttons and whores. Oh, liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. Oh, my. Liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. Oh, my. Liars, thieves, gluttons, and whores. Oh, my. Welcome. You are on the air with me, Nancy Adair, the host of LTGW, that's Liars, Thieves, Gluttons, and Whores, the podcast that brings you the truth, the dark side, as well as the light side of both addiction and recovery. Today, I have with me my guest, Glenn Simpson, and please give him a warm welcome. Hey, Nancy. Great to be on the podcast today. I'm not sure which one of the categories I fall under, but I anticipate that I probably fall under all of them <laughs> at one point or time or another, but good to be here. Thanks. Thank you. As many of my guests do, you know, and that's part of the purpose of Liars, Thieves, Gluttons, and Whores is just to talk about how pervasive addiction is and that once you're in that horrendous cycle of addiction. It grabs hold and changes all areas of our lives, not just the substances. We become users, not just of a substance, but of people and we allow ourselves to be used. It's, it's, um, it can be nightmarish. And I also think it can be hysterically funny, you know, that there's a real light side to um, addiction as well. So tell me, Glenn, how long have you been on this path to recovery? Well, it's a very interesting question. And there's a variety of ways to answer it. You know, I consider myself as someone that's been uh, in recovery, you know, all 52 years of my life. But I'm pretty sure I know what you're getting at here. And I, and I stepped into my recovery um, 21 years ago. Does that mean that I have 21 years of abstinence? So many people will, will judge their own recovery by abstinence dates, et cetera. No, I don't. But I did step into my recovery 21 years ago, and there's been a lot of crash, bang, booms along the way. And um, I think you know each one of those crash, bang, booms along the way uh, helped inform the quality of my recovery today, because it really is for me about quality, not quantity. And it's about experiencing, you know, real genuine joy, care and concern for other people and for myself. My brother, Bob Chiller, often hosts this show with me. And he and I were having a conversation once about the quality of our sobriety long before our sibling, my sister, joined in recovery as well. <laughs> it's a whole family. Apparently, affair. it's a family disease. Imagine that. And she was like, what do you mean quality of sobriety? You're either sober or you're not. And that is an opinion <laughs> that many people share. Just because you're sober doesn't mean you're well. <laughs> That's so true. Tell me about the the crash that kind of was the last straw that had you officially enter into this community that we call recovery. Sure. I mean, sometimes spiritual awakenings come in rude awakenings. And I had, I mean, it's, I had checked into this hotel room with, with the intent to drink and drug myself. Uh, to death. You know, my substance use disorder had reached a point of I'm checking out. And so I checked in to this hotel <laughs> and with all intents and purposes of pulling a leaving Las Vegas and doing a Nicolas Cage. And, you know, he did it in two hours and he got to sleep with Nick, with, uh, with Elizabeth Shue. Um, <laughs> unfortunately for me, I checked into that room and I was in there for uh, three years. And <laughs> You know, the level of um, disconnection, depression, desperation led me to, I'm going to give recovery a shot again. I weaned myself down off these, uh, off these drugs and off this alcohol. 
um, that I was, um, you know, the, the trap of it that I was caught in. And I had this job opportunity that was going to take me on a tour of the United States, 32 cities in 32 days. Um, but I had to clean my act up in order to make this happen. I got on the plane and landed in Seattle where this tour was going to start. I got off the plane. We had had a long layover in Detroit. And when I got off that plane in Seattle, the guys took a look at me and they said, Glenn, you're a liability. And I found myself back on the plane, with a pocket full of money. I'm walking through the aisle of the plane. I'm disconnected again. I'm desperate again. I'm angry. Somebody had their legs stuck out in the middle of first class and I crashed into that leg and I felt just this white, hot, Hulk smash type rage come over me. I think I even had my fist raised and I heard this strangely familiar voice say, Jesus, man, you look like shit. And I looked up into the tattooed face of Mike Tyson. <laughs> the baddest man on the planet. The man who knows a thing or two about being effed up. So that plane was supposed to land. Uh, you know, Mike Tyson and I did not tangle, you know. <laughs> I might be a drunk, but I'm not, but I'm not stupid. That plane was supposed to land in, uh, in Portland, Maine. Uh, I woke up uh, in a hospital room with a nurse attempting to uh, inject me with something, saying, Mr. Jackson, it's time for your ECT treatment. Welcome to Monroeville, Pennsylvania. Couple of problems there. ECT treatment is electroshock therapy. And my last name is not Jackson. As I said, spiritual awakenings come in rude awakenings. You know, they figured out who the real Mr. Jackson was. He seemed pretty excited for my shocking new opportunity. Um, <laughs> that got sorted out and I found myself, you know, sitting on the edge of that bed in a very familiar place. And, and uh, I said a prayer that I hadn't said in a long time. And it's a prayer I still say every morning. Uh, I think the, the easiest prayers to answer are the most simple ones. And I simply said, help. And in that moment, I had a feeling that things were going to be all right. I saw a woman through, through the doorway. She was struggling to get to the, to the lunchroom of this detox slash psych ward. You know, they like to throw us all together now because it makes things more exciting for staff, I think. Um, she was having much bigger problems than I. Audio, vis visual, hallucinations. And I helped her to the lunchroom and I just sat with her and listened and it was in that moment that, you know, I heard this voice say to me, just don't drink today. Just don't drug today and try to help somebody out. And that was seven years ago. And I haven't had a drink or a drug uh, since that time. And some really amazing things have, have happened in my life from, from that moment where, I mean, the first day of my recovery, I was, I was disconnected, desperate depressed. I was, I hadn't seen my folks in three years. I hadn't seen my kids in two. I was $38,000 in debt. I had no job. I had no house. I had no driver's license. And I went, then there was a warrant for my arrest. That was, that was day one. That definitely does qualify <laughs> the darkness. And I love what you said too, Glenn, that even as dark as it was for you and as desperate as you were, you could see that there were people that were suffering even more. Another comment I want to make too about your story is that electric shock treatment and having the wrong individual last name, you know, as you're about to receive that is part of the, what I consider the light side. It, especially since you didn't receive the, <laughs> what, what do we say? There's a bottle in front of me or a frontal lobotomy. <laughs> yeah, I, I may have been uh, on the verge of that. Uh, right. It was definitely a, like a one flew over the cuckoo's nest moment. Exactly. How has your life transformed in seven years? Well, like I said, I, okay, I, 
you know, I sent that prayer out to the higher power, the creator, the higher self, spirit of the universe, whatever, you, Bruce Lee, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> you know, and, and it was answered. My, my next call was to my next higher power. I called my mother. <laughs> and mom sent me a bus ticket from Monroeville, Pennsylvania to Portland, Maine, where I'd, where I'd lived in the past and had found recovery. I knew Portland had a strong recovery community. While I was in that place, they let me check my cell phone. Completely random call, an answered prayer. A friend I hadn't talked to in years had called me and said, Glenn, I've got a room for rent in Scarborough. Are you interested? So I came back to Southern Maine and I moved into a room. I had to walk into uh, the Cumberland County Courthouse and say, I hear there's a warrant for my arrest. The person behind the counter said, Mr. Simpson, we have no record of that. Answered prayers again. And there's an opportunity, you know, there's an opportunity. So I found myself working in a convenience store a couple days a week. Um, you know, I had worked in the, in the music business for over 20 years. People used to ask me for my autograph, and there I am behind the counter at the convenience store selling cigarettes and booze and lottery tickets to folks. And I began to make connections with people in there. And life just began to, life began to change. I began to connect with people in there. Other people in recovery, other people suffering. I was able to listen to these stories. I don't know. It was like I became the, the, <laughs> the minister of the convenience store. <laughs> A year later, I was the manager of that convenience store. And I had uh, another thought that sort of entered into, into my head was, Glenn, what is it that you're really passionate about? And what I was really passionate about was, you know, connecting with people, um, helping people, being of service, mm -hmm. being able to, to, to listen and be present with someone as they told their. So I went back to school and I finished my bachelor's degree. I'd been working on that thing for, for 10 years. Um, I became an alcohol and drug counselor and got to work with folks. And after a little while, I went back to school again. And so it took me 10 years to get my, uh, my bachelor's degree. And it took me 14 months to get my master's degree. And now I have an opportunity today to, um, to sit with people and listen to people and ask them the question that was never asked of me. What do you want your recovery to look like? Great. So it's not just recovering by putting the substances down. There's so much more to it than that. There has been for me, you know, my holistic approach to healing that I practice in my own life and talk about with, with people that I, that I work with, I think of it as almost like a three-dimensional globe. And there's these different pieces that, that fit in there. You know, for some people, it might be participating in, you know, mutual aid groups. For other folks, it, a piece might be participating in therapy or group therapy, going to the gym with other folks in recovery. I think creativity is a huge part. Folks that I work with, I'm not an art therapist, but, you know, my minor was in creative arts and social justice. And so I use art uh, as therapy, as a way to have conversations about recovery, with individuals and with, uh, and with communities. Uh, creativity is such an important piece that sometimes gets lost within the, uh, within the recovery process. And it's been such an important part in my own story. And I just, I love being able to connect with people and, and create um, with people. And I've had opportunities to do that with individuals and with communities uh, around the state of Maine. So tell me about that, because I can see behind you one of the large puzzle pieces. And yes. why don't you share that with my listeners as well? Because that certainly was a very big creative project that involved so many people. Yeah, so it was a project. It was called Pieces of Recovery, the Puzzle Project. And the idea was that uh, the opposite of addiction is connection. So I traveled around the state of Maine 
with hundreds of puzzle pieces. These puzzle pieces were a foot and a half by a foot across. And we went to treatment centers and detoxes and recovery community centers and recovery rallies. Any place that folks were talking recovery, we were there creating with them. And the prompt was simply, what does recovery look like for you? And people created that. They would paint, draw, collage on these, on these puzzle pieces. We got a little grant from the University of New England to travel around the state. We hit all 16 counties and traveled over 3,000 miles. And at the end, we had um, 418 puzzle pieces. That number, 418, was important because at the time, 418 people had died in the state of Maine mm -hmm. from a disorder that is preventable and treatable. You know, 418 families in the state of Maine living through a nightmare that they prayed that they'd never have to. So we had 418 of these puzzle pieces. And when we connected them together, it created what became known as the recovery wall. And it was nearly six feet tall and it was 80 feet long. And we brought that around the state and the recovery rallies and we brought it to the state house and we brought it to recovery centers around the state of Maine and just began having conversations with communities and with individuals. We met people who had lost people they loved. We met people who didn't understand that substance use disorder is not a moral issue. I'm not talking about bad people trying to get good. We were able to connect with people who didn't understand that substance use disorder is not a criminal justice issue, right? Not gonna arrest our way out of this. It's interesting opportunities to use art to have conversation and say, we're not talking about a moral issue, a social issue, a criminal justice issue. We're talking about a brain issue. See people read these stories and see this art and connect and connect with it. I started an organization, it's called RAD, the Radical Recovery Art Directive. And we use art to create change with individuals and communities. And we've expanded the puzzle project ideas into some local high schools um, in the state of Maine. And so we're having conversations, bringing somebody who's in recovery into the high school to tell their story and then we make some art and we, and we have some conversation with, um, with some of our teenagers in the state of Maine. That's powerful healing. It is. It truly is powerful to use art to, to connect, to create. The number of young people that I've met across the state of Maine that are opioid orphans is astounding. It's astounding. And that, and that trauma... You know, we, we know that that, that that trauma is, is, is generational and, and we have these kids that are suffering and we use art as a way to, let's start having conversations about what healing might look like. Opioid orphans, you're talking about young children who have lost one or more parents to overdose and death. Or incarceration. Okay. Yes, they're orphans then too. Well, thank you so much, Glenn. I really appreciate your sharing not only your personal story, but the impact that you're having in the community. And I believe that can be global as well. We're, we're very much on the same page in terms of art and creativity. And I think that's what all recovery is about. You know, we're given certain gifts by our creator and our gift is to give that back to take what's spiritual and put it into material form in the form of art whether that be music or writing or painting or puzzle pieces or craft anything that's creative absolutely and so it's great to collaborate with you here today sure so i really appreciate the opportunity to to uh to connect with you today thank you great you can find us on Facebook. And if you're even more curious and interested of how you can help and how you can uh, connect and create with us. So if you'd like to participate, you can reach out to us at RAD, Radical Recovery Art Directive, on our Facebook page.